Hello and good morning. Um, I'm very fortunate today to have a chance to have a conversation with Johnny C. Taylor, Taylor, the CEO and president of the Society for HR Managers, or SHRM, as I'm allowed to Sherm, say. Yes. yes, this is an organization that covers well over 300,000 HR leaders and 90% of the Fortune 500. Johnny, you have most recently been recognized for an incredible book, Reset, A Leader's Guide to Work in Any Age of Upheaval. It seems like a perfect uh, link to the, the theme of the conference, Creative Resilience. Could you share with us some of the key markers from your book that might help us connect some of the lessons? Yeah, the, the, the biggest takeaway, and I think it's important to put in context how I got to this book, and it was March of 2020. I was sitting at home, like many of us, office workers confronting what we didn't know, the unknown, which was this thing called COVID. And working remotely, I decided that I was going to write a book, and the book was gonna be called The Great Pause. Because if you recall at the time, we were told 21 days, 30 days, if you hunker down, we'll get back to normal. So I figured this is what life is like when you press the pause button, and then we start all over in 21 or 30 days. Well, fast forward six months into it, it was clear that we were not having a pause moment. In fact, we were having a great reset moment. Some of the major takeaways is uh, that, that we learned that while I was writing this book and that we've captured based upon our data at SHRM is, one, employees changed at the DNA level. Mm. They had a lot of time where if you recall in March and April, at least in the States, you couldn't go to a movie theater, you couldn't go to a coffee shop, you had did nothing to do but engage in some serious introspection. On the other side of that, the employees started to ask themselves, do I wanna work, for whom do I wanna work, where do I wanna work, how long do I, so they really questioned their relationship with work. And as a result, they literally on an individual level had reset moments, and that started with that. Secondly, biggest one is, that word that we used to formally refer to as a soft word, culture. Employees actually said, no, it's a pretty hard word. And I'm going to demand that you as an employer be able to articulate what our culture is. And this is more than foosball machines and you know the stuff that we did in the tech space, you know, right? It's deeper than that. I want to know how things work around here. I want you to tell me what I can expect. If I give you my time, what will I get in return from that? That was the biggest sort of second aha moment to me is that culture was going to matter in ways after the pandemic that frankly had not mattered as much pre-pandemic. We call it culture 2.0. Culture 1.0 was the foosball machines and free food and et cetera. 2.0 is how do things really work around here. The third area is a big focus on skilling. And while AI, and I hope we get to talk about that more, because AI wasn't in this book because it was not a big topic then, but this idea of skilling. People were becoming very quickly aware that the degrees that they had earned, the preparation, all of their experiences were essentially made no longer relevant because of how much change we were experiencing. So the jobs they had today, we knew, Jenny Rometty at the time and I, worked on the American Workforce Policy Advisory Board. We were members under the Trump administration, and I can tell you, big discussions around how do we get people reskilled, upskilled, cross-skilled. Those are the three biggest areas. Oh, one other, diversity, equity, inclusion. You cannot ignore that at that time, right about, so you had March 2020, the pandemic, shortly thereafter, George Floyd. So in a couple of months, we had a racial reckoning that opened up a broad, broad discussion around not just racial, uh, diversity as one dimension, but diversity, equity, inclusion more broadly. Those are the three big takeaways. Thank you. That's very interesting. Now, I want to ask you about AI in a moment. Okay. But first, there is a very energized discussion around the worth of a college degree yes. and the need to update skills on a much more frequent basis, as you're mentioning. And SHRM is innovating in this area. Yeah. Help us better understand the SHRM view of skilled credentials and the challenges and opportunities for hiring in this category. So the notion that we embraced, and frankly all of us did, it wasn't uh, just the Americans, but globally, was this idea that degrees were a proxy for smart. And we, that came out of the information era, if you will. Now that we've gotten into a different era, one that, that is, is uh, 
includes fewer people. We have a birth rate problem in most of the developed world. We have a birth rate and replenishment problem. We also know that things are changing so quickly. So this reliance on the degree as the way to exclude people from jobs as opposed to finding ways to include them in job opportunities has changed significantly. We at SHRM recognize that, the SHRM Foundation, and said precisely that. We've got to figure out how to ensure that people who have the ability to do a job but don't have a degree get to do that job, that they are seen. I know at IBM, you all were very early on in this work in ensuring, I remember Jenny saying, 50% of our new hires won't have degrees. And that's something that 20 years ago, heck, 10 years ago, was not acceptable. We used the, the degree to decide who would get to the next, who would even get an interview. No longer is that the case. Well, so Sherm says, I don't think that should be the case because really smart companies, leaders like IBM said, not so. But then they said, well, how do we know if a person, in fact, can do the job? And that means how do you identify the skills that one needs? And to the extent one doesn't have the skills necessary to do the job, how do you train them to do those jobs? Because here's the catch. I finished law school, I'm in, I hate to admit, <laughs> in the 90s or so. Late 90s, if I'm lying. But, but the idea is, but everything has changed since I finished law school. So I've got to, even with that college degree and the multiple college degrees, I've got to reskill myself. And that is now the discussion. The discussion is how do we help employees equip themselves to be uh, employable over the decades? Very interesting. So let's move to the AI discussion. Yeah, in fact, everyone wants to talk about yeah, it. Yeah, but in fact, HR has been adapting and using AI and machine learning for quite some time. That's right. But with the latest developments with generative AI, how is HR changing and what's working well now? What are the problems you see as a longer term? And what has surprised you the most about this stage in technology evolution? Well, you're going to talk about it. So the irony is today, November 30th, <laughs> was the one year anniversary of the introduction of ChatGPT. <laughs> Is that really odd? It's, we talk about it as if it's been around forever and it consumes so much ink in the media and time and space, but the reality is, Today, November 30th of 2022 is when you introduced ChatGPT. Now, clearly, the technologists have been working for, working on this perhaps a, a decade or so. But to the average person, this is new. HR, to your point, we've used technology, but nothing like generative AI. Nothing like it. And there's increasingly a conversation around, ultimately, singularity. The idea that perhaps even in HR, and you all were leaders in this space in IBM, that the conversation is, do we need as many HR people? As a result of this, can this technology make us more efficient, more fair? You know, the use of technology in terms of, you know, we know human beings don't. We're horrible interviewers and selectors of people. Mm. I mean, we just, as great as we think we are, we're not particularly good at it. Mm. Fast forward, AI can actually help us do it better. So here's the biggest takeaway. And, and I get, didn't get to talk about it in the book because we weren't talking about it then, uh, this AI talk. Someone said to me, Johnny, will AI take some of the jobs in HR? And the answer is yes. But your bigger threat is not AI. What we know is people who, who, who know how to use and embrace AI, that's who's going to take your job. So if you're an HR practitioner who doesn't and refuses to embrace this technology, then you will lose your job to a person who does, not AI in and of itself, right? So AI is not the enemy. We have to embrace this thing. And we at Sherm, for example, right now are encouraging people to use it in talent acquisition. Do it in asynchronous reskilling. We talk about the need to reskill people, but we are not, we don't fully appreciate the advantages of what AI can help us do. And supposed to sending someone off, or someone off to get an expensive four-year degree, AI, we can help educate people in the moment quickly uh, and, and, and quite efficiently, frankly, and most importantly, effectively. Well, thank you. Still, there are some trends in employment that show continued challenges in filling open positions yes. for the skill groups that are needed and even to retain highly skilled people. Mm -hmm. Loyalty may be an antiquated word in these times. How might opening the lens to underserved, underrepresented groups help this situation? Yeah, we, we talk a lot about untapped pools of talent. Mm. And untapped pools, obviously, you know, historically they were women, underrepresented minorities. But it's now broadened to, for example, 
the formerly incarcerated. Mm -hmm. You have someone who was taken out of society uh, for 10, 20 years and you want to bring them back. If we have a labor shortage, there's 700,000 people in the US alone every year who exit our prisons. That is a, a group of people who need to work, generally who want to work, and we need to find a way to skill them up. So that's an untapped pool of talent that we, we need to focus on and not continue to hold on to our biases against people who've made mistakes. That's one area. A group that we don't really talk about, um, or we think I think we talk about them in the wrong way, is people who are differently abled. And I use that term intentionally. That's different from saying they're disabled, mm -hmm. because disabled focuses on what they can't do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Differently abled means they are capable of doing some things, they just do those things differently. And how can we tap into that community and bring them into the workforce to deal with the shortage? The third area that you've alluded to and that we're all talking about is people without a degree. This idea, again, that historically where we've excluded people who didn't have the four-year degree, we have to be willing as employers and HR professionals to think differently. That is a sea shift, as you know, from anyone who's been practicing in HR, in HR over five, seven, ten years. If you're 20 years or 30 years into practice, this notion that you would hire someone into an executive role, not just entry-level roles or you know, sort of office-level administrative jobs, but into executive jobs who doesn't have that degree, and not just that degree, but degree with the right grades from the right school. I mean, we've been incredibly exclusive in our approach that I think we've got to, that's a group of people who are willing and able to do great things for our organizations, but we have got to change our minds about their ability to do it. So these are the groups that we think of, and there are many, women, for working mothers, there are a number of untapped pools of talent who will help us solve for the worker shortage. Well, I wish you well on that. We all wish you well on that. I want to say that, Johnny, when I looked at your bio, I thought to myself, this is living the life of learning about business, yes. learning about people, <laughs> learning about HR and what you need to do, and culture. Yes. You, you're, I encourage everyone to look at Johnny's bio because it really, you live the talk. Thank you. So I'd like to ask you the Peter Drucker question. Mm -hmm. you know, he used to look out the window and see what's visible but not yet seen. So. When you look out the window now, what do you see? Wow, I'm gonna limit this to the context of work. And it's actually, AI has forced me to see this. So in some ways, what I don't see is our ability to tap into the eight billion people on the planet. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what I don't. Uh, and I, you're gonna hear a, a recurring theme we have, and I own it in HR, we've spent a lot of our time focused on excluding groups of people. Mm -hmm. you know, And the process has not been about how do we bring people into the workforce. I think as I look, one, we don't have the luxury of doing it. We have a birth rate problem in most of the developed world, right? And secondly, we have a skills problem. So even if you had a num the people, they don't have the skills that we need in industry necessarily, and government and nonprofit sector everywhere. We just need people who have the skills, and so we have a match problem. If I'm looking out that window, I think we've got to figure out how to match people with jobs, no matter where they are, no matter where they start from. But we have got to figure this out, and I think AI is going to help us do that. Thank you. We need more leaders like you. Thank, Thank you for you. your time and for this interview. And now I will be handing over to Justin Brady, who will be interviewing Pierre Lamont. Thank you so very much for your Thank insights, you. for your leadership, and we wish you all the energy you need for leading as you do. Thank I'm you. I'm going to need it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>